Let us pray. O oh God, let your Spirit be among us. If minds are distraught, let them be calmed. If hearts hurt, let them be healed. If souls be stained, let them be cleansed. And when we have received the good news of your Son's love, let us not be ashamed to share it with other people. For it's through your Son's grace we pray. Amen. And Ashley, I'm a gene. I'm sorry I failed to mention you in the announcements. Uh, Ashley's twin sister died this past week, and uh, the funeral was yesterday, so our sympathy still goes with you. Okay. Today we honor our moms, living and dead, good and bad, near and far. Not everybody can be a mom, but everyone at some time in their life has had one. And at that time, our mom was probably the most important person in the world. Some of us had moms who made tremendous sacrifice for us. And we're profoundly grateful for all that that mom gave us. So today we honor our moms, those by genetics, those by emotion, those by a relationship, and those of our spiritual moms who nurtured us spiritually along the way. No, it's not easy being a mom. And here are some examples of some mothers and things they could have said. Mona Lisa's mother, after all that money your father and I spent on braces, and that's the biggest smile you could give. <laughs> and then there's Humpty Dumpty's mother. Humpty, if I told you once, I told you a hundred times, you sit on the wall, you'll fall. But no. Christopher Columbus's mother. I don't care what you discovered, you could have written. <laughs> Michelangelo's mother. Mike, can't you paint on walls like other children? <laughs> Napoleon's mother. All right, Napoleon, if you're going to hide your hand in that jacket, Pull it out so I can see your report card. <laughs> and of course, Jonah's mother. Remember Jonah? Well, that's a nice story, but now tell me where you've really been for the last three days. <laughs> no, it's not easy being a mother. I don't have first-hand knowledge of that. I have second-hand knowledge of that. My mother tried to rear me, and I know how difficult being a mother can be. Now in chapter 15, the writer of John's Gospel quotes Jesus as saying this, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. And if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remained in His love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. I'm going to repeat that. Love each other as I have loved you. Now, I think we're all mature enough in the faith to realize that God does not have a gender Projecting a, a father title on God just helps us communicate. God is spirit. God is neither male nor female. And this is one time when it would be the most appropriate to substitute the word mother for father, I think. 
And in the light of, of this special day, these words would read this way if we did that. As my mother has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love, and if you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my mother's commandments and remain in her love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. As William Makepeace Thackeray once said, Mother is the name for God in the lips and hearts of children. So let us begin here with this. We love, we love because God first loved us. That's the message. That's the message for us this day. And in this passage, Jesus goes beyond, if you will, the golden rule. The golden rule says, love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? But in this passage, Jesus exceeds the golden rule. Jesus says we are to love each other as he has loved us. There's a difference. And the standard that Jesus gave is much harder than the golden rule. You see, our human love is very frail. It's temporal. It's periodic. It doesn't stand the test. It's conditional. It's transient. And most often, it's selective. Today, you may love someone, but tomorrow you may not love them. Right? You know, just get on Facebook and say something that somebody doesn't like. Right? And they don't love you anymore. Today we may love someone because they simply are lovable. We may love them simply because they agree with us. We love them because they act like us. They think like us. They make the same choices that we make. Hold the same theology as us. And the philosophy of life. But let any one of those things crack and our love tends to flee. Just as damning, often we love those people who are just like us. You know, who share our backgrounds. Eat grits like we eat grits, right? That's where we are today in our country. Politically, socially, Yes, even theologically and spiritually. We love those who are like us. And Jesus' love, on the other hand, is for all people. Those who are unlike us and don't act like us or think like us. There was a young lady who was a writer of a magazine. And for Valentine's Day, she wanted to write a love article. So she went to the editor and she asked permission to write this love article. And the editor said, but before you do, tell me what you think love is. And she came back with starry eyes and said, it's, it's looking upon a lily pond with the one closest to your heart by the light of the moon while the lilies are in full bloom. Stop. Just stop right there, said the editor. Let me tell you what real love is. It's getting out of a warm bed on a cold winter's night and filling hot water bottles for sick children. That sounds like the voice of experience to me. But our editor was right. Love, real love, is sacrificial. And even though we may not feel we are sacrificing anything at the time, none of us, if we're healthy emotionally, uh, love our children as they love us or love ourselves. We love them far more than they love us. The golden rule 
is sufficient or is insufficient for the relationship between a parent and a child. We're called to love that child more than that child is ever going to love us. We love, our love can never measure up to agape love, the love of God, but that's what we're called to express in our lives, the very love of God, the love that God has shown us, we are to show to others. But here's the real test, I think, of Christian love. Can you and I love all of God's children? Can we love all of God's children like we, uh, like we love our own child? That's what Christ is asking for us to do. Love others as he has loved us. Wow, that is hard, isn't it? Especially when those people try to undo you, say cruel things about you, criticize you, uh, make life hard for you. It's tough. It's tough, but that's what the Christ is calling us to be and to do, is to love the most difficult. One morning in 2012 in Winnipeg, Canada, uh, Canada a, a transient bus driver by the name of Chris Double D, who was 38 years old, was riding down the street with a busload of people, trying to get them to work, and all of a sudden the bus came to a stop, the door opened, he gets off and goes over to a street, uh, to a corner, and there was a fella sitting there on the corner without shoes. And everybody on the bus just stood up and started peeking out the window, and they saw the driver sit down beside this man and begin to take off his shoes and his socks. And not only did he hand them to the poor fellow, he started putting his socks on the other man's feet. And he put the shoes on the other man's feet. And when he got back on the bus, the people were just astounded. Why did you do that? Why did you, why did you do that? He said, I just couldn't stand it any longer thinking, thinking that I had a, a closet full of shoes. And there's a man on the corner that has none. And I believe that's what Jesus would have me to do in the love of Jesus. We see that kind of love sometimes in those who, who care for the aged and, and the dying. There, there was a beautiful story in Reader's Digest a few years back, and it was written by a woman in Rhode Island. And <clears throat> she wrote that only three times in her entire life did she see her father cry. She said the first time she saw him cry was when, he, when she was seven and his his uh, grandmother died, and the second time she saw him cry was at the airport when her brother departed for Vietnam. The third time she saw her father cry was when he was in his 80s. And his mo her mother had Alzheimer's, and he would go and sit with her all day at the hospital. And then he broke his foot. And he couldn't go for over six weeks. And then when the foot was better, he went straight back to that hospital and he went in and he walked up to her bed and said, Mommy, and she said, Stan, and he started to cry. He said, Mommy, I thought you would have forgotten me by now. Love, love is commitment, it's dedication, love is loyalty. We know a little bit of what it means to love as Jesus loved to love those who are closest to us. But the question is, can we expand that circle of love to include even those we don't like, even those who uh, may not be a part of our political party, those who may not see things theologically exactly the way you and I see them, you know, those who weren't born here in God's country. Let me tell you about a dog. It made the papers a few years back. Now, some of you have dogs, and you know especially how, how, you know how special they can become in your life. My daughter has a beagle named Harper, and that dog is just 
swallowed my heart up. Heart up. I mean, I love that critter. We go out and play every day, you know. And my daughter Nancy, she said, "Daddy, you stole my dog." But this dog started refusing to eat. And one of the things the dog liked most was a bone. So the owner put a bone down in his tray, and the dog picked the bone up and went outside and didn't come back for a long time. And every day when he put something down for this dog to eat, the dog would put it in its mouth and go and leave and not come back for a spell. So he followed that dog one day. And when he went into the woods behind the dog, his dog was sitting down dropping food in front of another dog that was caught in a fence and could not get out. That dog shows a love and kindness that sometimes we Christians don't even show. I like to think maybe the dog went to Sunday school one time. In my book, that dog is superior to a lot of people. Actually, Jesus gives us two commands in this passage. The first is to remain in his love. And the way we remain in his love is to practice what we preach. The way we remain in God's love is to do exactly what God expects of us. And the second part of this is love each other as he has loved us. Mark Buchanan in his book, uh, Hidden in Plain Sight, tells about a time a number of years ago when he was struggling with his attitude towards a certain man. And he said he, he, he just fed his resentment towards this fellow, and there was bitterness in his soul, and he, he learned to create hate in his heart. And one day when he was thinking about, thinking nasty thoughts about this man, he heard his son come home in the basement, slam the door, go to his room, and he started crying. And he went down and he said, son, what's wrong? He said, well, we were out playing street hockey, and I missed several goals. They scored, and they started making fun of me. They started ridiculing me and telling me that it would be better not even have the net protected, blah, blah, blah. And, and the dad got angry. See, he's already fueled with anger towards this man. So now something else enters in his life, and he's angry about this, and he decides he's going to go down there and tell these kids off. He's going to tell these kids off. Nobody's going to treat his child that way. Well, he said he heard an inner voice. And the voice said, Mark, where are you going? To straighten this matter out, Lord. No one treats my son that way. You have a father's heart, God said. Yes. You hate it when someone hurts one of your children. Yes. And God says, I hate that too. I hate that too. And at that moment, Buchanan says he understood in the most visceral way and for the first time in his life that he could not claim the love of God in, in, in his life unless he loved everybody the way God had loved him. In other words, he realized that love was the basis of Christian faith. And without the love in his own heart, he could not call himself Christian. Think about that for a moment. It makes you angry when someone threatens to hurt one of your children, doesn't it? Or hurt one of your grandchildren? Do you feel that same anger when your children hurt any place in the world? Do you feel that same anger when some child hurts in North Myrtle Beach rather than Myrtle Beach? Or in North Carolina rather than South Carolina? Or in Europe or the South, uh, South America or in the Middle East rather than here in the United States? We love because Christ first loved us. 
And unless we have Christ's love in our hearts, we simply cannot love others who are outside our circle. Ripley's, believe it or not, I'm not talking about the one down there, I'm talking about the book. Ripley's, believe it or not, says that the longest love letter in, the history, in history was a, a love letter written by a Frenchman in 1879. By, his name was Marcel de la Cour. And he wrote that letter to Magdala de la Rey. And it was um, simple. It had only three words repeated over and over and over again. And it said, I love you. And it was written 1,875,000 times. I love you. There was a little trick to that. He didn't actually write it. He dictated it. He dictated the letter. But the writer uh, says that, um, that Ripley says it was the, a, a great feat. Never was love made manifest by as a great an expenditure of time and effort. I would have gotten a little closer to it if he had actually written it himself instead of a secretary. And it sounds like a great story, but Ripley was wrong. There was once a time when love was made manifest by a greater expenditure of time and effort than that Frenchman. It was a time when God himself came and hung on a cross. God didn't send a secretary to do it for him. God sent himself to show love. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I I command, he says. This is my command. Love each other. Golden rule is wonderful, isn't it? And we've repeated it several times. Interesting enough, we usually don't say what Jesus said about it. We just repeat the golden rule because it demands more of us than the golden rule. We're not simply to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. We are called to do unto others that Christ would do unto them. In other words, we're called to be the Christ to other people. Not just the ones we like, not just to the ones that eat grits, not just from the ones from our place or think like us, but everyone. God did not dictate his love letter to humanity. God delivered himself to show God's own love for God's own children. Okay? Do unto others as I have done unto you. Amen?